Well, hello and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas and we both work at the University of Kentucky in the forestry extension in the forestry department and Billy we've got something exciting to uh, announce to everyone. You know Renee I am so glad to be here with everybody and a real big thank you all for being with us today. We're glad whether you're joining us via Zoom or via Facebook Live. Thanks so much and thank you for helping us celebrate our one year that anniversary year. a year. Yeah. Now, so <laughs> over 50 episodes we've put, got in the books now, but all of those are available online that you can watch at your leisure. Um, but a big thanks to our audience for keeping us going, giving us great feedback and being a part of this journey. Um, it's been quite enjoyable. Yeah, so we definitely could not do it without you folks. You know, we've we've gotten a lot of show ideas from our audience and we appreciate those. You can always go to fromthewoodstoday.com and give us any kind of show topics that you want. But we do have a special treat, kind of like a, a little preview of not every show because that would, you know, have been 50 clips, but a <laughs> lot of them. Um, and so we'd like to show you that. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining for our first edition of From the Woods Today. We would normally like to be out at a field day or a workshop or some other program, but um, we're trying to um, connect with the folks that are interested in woodlands and wildlife all across Kentucky. So that's kind of why we decided to create this show, um, is so that you all could maybe be able to do things that you might have time to do right now. Get in your woods. Time has went by very fast when it comes to the show. Well, and you know, Renee, a big acknowledgement to our audience out there. If it wasn't Definitely. for you all watching and um, being part of this, um, we would have stopped long ago. But um, because it's um, receiving some good attention and people are, uh, seem to be enjoying it and getting a lot of content out of it, um, you know, we hope to keep it going for um, the foreseeable future, for sure. So, yeah, thank you all so much for being with us every week. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. And walk into the forest where the squirrels are eating acorns and the chipmunks play. Under the shade of the tall and mighty oak where you can see what's going on from the woods today. From the woods today. You know, Billy, it's it's surprising that it's been a year already. You know, I can't believe that we've actually had 50 shows and, you know, it seems that it's had flown by, actually. Yeah, it's been great. It really has. It's been a great experience. So, you know, a big thanks to all of our guests who have come on and shared some amazing content, yes. you know, and I hope it's a reminder to everyone that there's a lot of organizations and people that are supportive of forestry and wildlife management here in the state. And we want to work with you and help you. So um, again, it's been awesome. It really has been great. 
It really has. So, yeah. you know, let's get on with our show for Keep today. Going. I know. <laughs> you know, we've got an interesting topic coming up that um, one of our professors, um, Dr. Matt Springer, has been working on for a while, and he's been working with some graduate students as well, um, talking about black vultures. Um, you know, right. that's a pretty important topic to a lot of our farming community out there, but it's also a really important migratory bird as well. So, um, Dr. Springer, glad to have you with us. Hey, how's everyone doing? Doing well. Thank doing you for well. joining us today. Yeah, excited to be here. Not a common topic for our viewers from the traditional forestry side of things, but one um, in wildlife that has been pretty hot in the ag community the last couple of years. So, um, so yeah, um, one of the things that I was hoping to, to discuss was a, a regional effort that he, we at UK are involved in uh, through the Wildlife Extension Program on black vultures. Um, specifically on, on, you know, some of the, what they're doing to livestock and the issues related to depredation, uh, but also some really interesting research that we have going on a very understudied uh, bird species, uh, which isn't a very common thing anymore um, with everyone that's interested in birds. But um, part of that reason is they're so difficult to work with. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I was hoping to go through some of what... Um, we're doing with this project today and um and talk a little bit about how may we may be able to get some help uh from our viewers uh to help us accomplish our goals with the the farm bill that went through a few years ago part of that actually had some extra money in it to accomplish a few goals for usda wildlife services who um outside of feral hogs black vultures is the number two most important thing on their radar in the southeast um, and with that funding package came some more money for feral hogs, which freed up their budget to focus on black vultures. Um, and with that said, um, you know, one of the big things that is causing a problem um, is this un unfortunate situation where black vultures are a more aggressive vulture species who actually will um, chase down and, and, and kill their prey as opposed to turkey vultures, which are basically acting as our, our cleanup crew in, in nature, uh, picking up and, and taking care of all the, the carrion, so dead animals uh, in, in the landscape. Um, black vultures do that as well, uh, but these guys have figured out how to take advantage of, of newborn livestock in particular or livestock that are sick and, or unhealthy. Um, and they'll get into these groups and, and attack um, these, these animals when they're vulnerable. And, uh, unfortunately they, they are successful, uh, in, in some cases. And we have estimates, um, since I've been here of around anywhere from 400 to 700, uh, reports in Kentucky alone each year. Um, and, you know, we've, we're digging into how accurate they are. Um, but there's, uh, quite a few are, um, definitely vultures are, are attacking and killing calves. Uh, so, Part of the big funding push um, from that money um, with USDA Wildlife Services is they've had a whole bunch of questions about black vultures that they don't know anything about the species um, because they really weren't on the radar until about 10, 15 years ago uh, when this, you know, their populations, we believe, have recovered fully from issues with DDT. Um, and, you know, we don't know much about them because they weren't really a big concern. And, and unfortunately, with limited funding and wildlife, it, it takes, you know, either they're causing a problem or they're, they're a resource to be utilized by hunters, trappers, fishermen, et cetera, to really manage, you know, manage them, uh, have funds come in to, to do all the, the, the proper um, management activities needed uh, for them. So what came out of... Um, USDA's uh, focus on black vultures is this need to look at a couple different things. Um, first and foremost, we don't know much about their survival, their movements, their their reproduction. Um, we, we think they are similar to eagles in that they have to mature to about five years before they start reproducing. Um, they're long-lived species, but we really don't know much of those particulars. Um, in addition, they wanted to address the actual um, interaction between black vultures and livestock. So that they have funded a, a big project through Purdue um, and uh, Patrick Zollner, uh, who's a, a really good um, movement ecologist up there. Um, they're, they've got a PhD and postdoc that they're working on, but they, they're looking at trying to answer those questions on top of trying to come up with this diagnostic of when they have a calf that's found by a producer, how do you determine if it was killed by a vulture or not? Uh, because there's funds through the 
the Farm Service Agency for depredation uh, reimbursement if it is killed by a black vulture. Uh, so coming up with a, a diagnostic of how to do that is one of the big goals. And that's one of the things that we're actually partnering with them on here in at UK and, and with the Cooperative Extension Service, where um, if we have producers that actually are um, experiencing a loss, we're, we're requesting that they potentially think about donating that that animal uh, to the project so that it can be used to come up with those diagnostic features. Uh, and, you know, there's the flyers on the screen there of who to contact. And um, you can reach out directly to me um, in Kentucky and I will come get it. Um, but for the producers, we want them to reach out to their county extension agent uh, or myself and we'll work through it and whether or not um, it's an animal that we want. And, and if so, then we pretty much are coming out there within 24 hours to get it as, as quickly as possible. Uh, the other project here at UK that um, we're going to get into with a video from the grad student that's working on is a cooperation uh, collaboration between uh, Andrea Durock's lab at Murray State University uh, and her stu grad student Phil, who's going to talk here in a second, um, looking at nesting success and fledgling survival and movement. So we're trying to come up with all the, the uh, population parameters uh, like survival, uh, movement, um, when do the animals start nesting that we are kind of lacking now to help build a population model on a grander scheme. Um, so with that said, I believe, Billy, uh, you have the video um, associated with uh, Phil's uh, little talk about we're looking for black vulture nests as we speak, and he's going to talk a little bit about that component. Hello, my name is Phil Cavoriaris, and I'm a graduate student at Murray State University. I'd like to talk to you today about my research on black vultures here in Kentucky and how you can help. The black vulture is a fairly common raptor here in the southeast, but as it turns out, there are a few important things we still need to figure out about these birds that would help us to more effectively manage their populations. So that's the main goal of my research here. We're trying to answer three main questions. One is figuring out how often their nests are successful, that is. How much of the time do their nests produce at least one chick that is able to leave the nest and head out on its own? The next question is figuring out what causes these nests to fail when they do, which most often in the bird world is due to predators taking the eggs or nestlings. Our final question is what happens to the birds that leave the nest or fledglings? Where do they go and are they able to successfully make the transition to adulthood? So to do this, we need to first find as many nests as we can to monitor their progress throughout the black vulture nesting season, which here in Kentucky ranges from about mid-March to late summer. So once a nest is found, I set up a trail camera with a clear view of the nest, as you can see in this picture. These cameras are motion activated and have infrared technology, so they can take pictures under low light conditions. We do this to minimize the human interaction with the nests, so we only need to visit the nests about every two weeks to collect the data. Pictured here is a setup of a black vulture nest in the loft of an abandoned barn in central Kentucky from earlier this spring. So let's talk now about how you can identify a black vulture in the field, which can be tricky at times because they're often found with the slightly larger turkey vultures, which they often use to find carrion or dead animals. That is their primary food source. The first thing to note is the difference in the heads. Black vultures have black or dark gray heads that are bare down almost to the middle of the neck, whereas turkey vultures have reddish pink heads with necks that are mostly feathered. The next important difference is the color of the plumage. Black vultures have all black feathers except for two prominent white wing patches near the tips of the wings. Turkey vultures have dark brown plumage with a two-toned underwing that will be more obvious on the next slide. Finally, a prominent difference can be observed in flight. Black vultures have quick, snappy wing beats in the air that are similar to that of crows and ravens. Turkey vultures, on the other hand, 
are most often soaring with only occasional slow heavy wing beats. Another tip to notice is that turkey vultures typically seem wobbly in the air, tilting back and forth from side to side. Here we have the turkey vulture on the left and the black vulture on the right. Notice the two-toned underwings and the white wing patches. So now that you know how to identify a black vulture, let's talk about their nesting habits and certain behaviors you can watch out for to help tell you if there's a nest nearby. Alright, so where do black vultures like to nest? So they prefer dark recesses, uh, which means that can include anything from rocky crevices and hollow logs, even to abandoned barns and sheds. These can be either on the ground or elevated on a bluff or up in a loft in a structure. Unlike most other birds, black vultures don't build a nest. They simply find a good spot and lay their eggs on whichever surface is present. Here you can see a vulture nest. This bird laid her eggs in an unused barn stall right in the dirt. Also note that there are two eggs present. Black vultures are known to lay only two eggs during nesting. So, how can you tell if there's a black vulture nest nearby? One thing to note is that these vultures are known to perch in the immediate area around a nest up to six weeks before laying their eggs, for reasons that aren't well understood. Another thing to watch out for, especially if you have a barn or structure on your property, is the presence of vultures flying in and out regularly. The parents do take turns incubating the eggs, so there will be regular comings and goings at a nest site. Finally, you might see young birds in odd places, especially later in the summer. These nestlings are easy to tell apart from the adults up close as they have much darker heads and a slight peach fuzz on their heads rather, rather than the grayish, wrinkly looking heads of the adults. Before the birds fledge in late summer, they will start to explore their home area as they learn to fly. So, you may happen to run into a curious young vulture around that time. So. What do you do if you find a nest or think there might be one nearby? First, don't try to approach the bird or the nesting area. We don't want to scare or stress out the bird unnecessarily. What you should do is observe the nest from a safe distance and if possible, take some pictures. Then, you should contact me at the email address or phone number provided here. If you have any pictures of the vultures in question, the nest or the nesting structure, that would be helpful to include as well. I'd really appreciate your help with this project. I think it's a pretty cool study and there's potential for us to learn a lot about these birds. Anyway, thanks for your time and I hope to be able to come back and share what we find with you later on. Thanks. Thank you. We appreciate that. And Matt, if you can thank Philip for us, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, but uh, is there any other things you want to let us know about black vultures that people may need to know about? Yeah, well, um, so, you know, they're a federally protected species. So we have that problem with the cattle is, and one of the reasons it's a, such a problem is um, because they are federally protected. So they can't just go out there like we do with, you know, the ability with uh, deer, raccoons, where you can potentially lethally solve the issue. This, that's a lot harder uh, in this scenario. And also, you know, we're, we're looking for non-lethal methods all the time. We want to figure this out so that we can deal with the problem without getting to that lethal component. And, you know, he, he, Phil is, and, and, you know, our entire project here within Kentucky is really, um, looking, trying to find these nests is a very difficult task. Uh, we don't have adult birds with, with backpack transmitters on, so we can't just follow them to their nest site. Um, we're just trying to find them at random. And, you know, that, that can be an, a much easier process if you're looking for something like uh, robin's nests 
uh, where, where they're everywhere. Black vultures are not going to be very obvious. Um, so we're really looking for as much help as we can get. If you have a vulture nest on your property and you're willing to allow us access for, for the spring and summer uh, a couple times, we'd greatly appreciate it and, and reach out to Phil, reach out to myself. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're just trying to fill some voids in, in the knowledge of the species and, and all of that's going to come down to helping uh, management of them for, you know, um, both for the bird side and, and the cattle side. Uh, interesting work, man. And I'm hopeful that some of our audience out there, you know, who's well connected across the state um, can help us uh, get this word out about this um, research so we can kind of help fill and help us uh, uncover um, some of these answers. I, yeah, we, we'd appreciate it for sure. And, and, you know, they're nesting right now. We've got, I think, 10, 10 or 11 nests with cameras on them, uh, which is 11 nests more than has ever been monitored on the species before. So, wow. yeah, it's, it's, we're just trying to get some info and uh, need as much help as we can get. Yeah. So, well, we'll look forward to hearing more about this project as you all get more and more data. For sure. And, and I see there's a question from Chris here. And uh, Chris, yes, yeah, so vultures have a tendency to just um, lay their eggs wherever they really like to. Um, and that it's, it's uh, bare ground is definitely an option. And, and part of the reason, you know, Phil uh, didn't come out and say it directly, but one of the things is telling the difference between the, vul the vultures is important because they, their nesting situation is pretty similar to each other. So identifying the adults that are there is vital to knowing whether it's a black vulture or a turkey vulture nest. So do a lot of uh, different animals eat on their eggs? We don't know. Like I said, this is the, yeah, we, um, you know. That's part in, of the problem, you don't know. In many ways, Phil's project as a, as a student who wants to publish a lot of papers, right, and grow that knowledge is um, right for that because everything is new. We don't know. And, and we're assuming that, you know, like every other bird nest, raccoons, skunks, possums, coyotes would all, well, maybe not coyotes in the barn, but coyotes on the ground could potentially be nest robbers and, and uh, nest predators. And, um, you know, but vultures are a pretty big, aggressive bird. Uh, they take down cows, so I would assume raccoons may or may not want to mess with them. So we're gonna we're gonna find out. Find out. Yeah. All right. Sounds like a future show, Billy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I we'll look forward for some of that um, trail camera footage. You know, yeah. some of stuff. I am looking forward to some of that trail camera footage. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, man. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks, man. All right. All right. So moving on to and our that, ever popular. I know. I can't believe it, Laurie. You have been doing the tree of the week for a year now. Right. <laughs> we appreciate it so much. I know it's like a, I'm taking dendrology all over again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, you're teaching us all. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, we learned something. Right. So well, this, today's tree. <laughs> so this week, um, I picked out a tree. I was out um, and I noticed, I was up actually at McConnell Springs and I noticed, hey, it's already in seed. And so it's the slippery elm. And um, so we've got, it, it, it will flower and leaf and flower and seed before the leaves have even come out. So I thought it'd be a good one to do since the leaves are just starting to emerge. Okay. Well, you know, it, it, I was going to say, this is one, and maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, but we've had some problems in the past, people trying to steal the bark off of this tree. So, uh, oh, really? Yeah. So some medicinal properties, but all right. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the slippery elm. Slippery elm, Almus rubra, is a graceful, arching, deciduous tree that has been widely valued for some of the medicinal properties of the inner bark. It is also known as red elm. It is a member of the Elmaceae family, which is comprised of about 18 to 19 genera and over 150 to 200 species of the temperate regions of both the northern and southern hemisphere. Only four genera are found in the United States. It is a medium-sized tree that typically grows 60 to 70 feet tall and 18 to 30 inches in diameter. It is a moderately fast-growing tree that can live to about 200 years. It resembles American elm in general appearance, except it tends to have a taller, clear trunk and the branches and twigs are less drooping. Slippery elm is found throughout the eastern United States into the Midwest. It grows best in moist, rich soils of lower slopes and floodplains. It can also grow on drier hillsides with limestone soils. It is seldom found in pure stands and is usually mixed with other deciduous trees throughout its wide range. It is classified as shade tolerant, and slippery elm is susceptible to Dutch elm disease like the American elm, as well as elm yellows and phloem necrosis. 
The leaves of slippery elm are deciduous, alternately arranged on the twig, and simple in form, as you can see in the photo. They are ovate to oblong and about four to six inches long and typically two to three inches wide. The leaf margins are coarsely serrated and the base of the leaf is unequal, as you can see in the photo. They are dark green above and very rough, almost like sandpaper. The underside is paler and also scruffy. The twigs are stouter than American elm and more pubescent. Fall color is a golden yellow. Slippery elm is monoecious, meaning that a tree will have both male and female flowers, and the flowers are small and relatively inconspicuous. They are usually lightish green or reddish and in tight clusters of three to five. They bloom before the leaves appear in early spring, and the flowers are wind pollinated. The fruit is a small, round, papery samara that is about three-fourths to one inch across. While the seeds are small, they are larger than the other elms. The seeds ripen quickly between April and June, depending on location. They are wind dispersed, and trees begin seed production around 15 years of age and will have large seed crops every two to four years. The bark of slippery elm is reddish brown and can be distinguished from American elm bark because it does not have the layered buff colored streaks. The bark is fissured but not diamond shaped. The ridges are more parallel and often, coarsely, often into coarsely scaly plates. The inner bark has a gelatinous consistency and it is somewhat aromatic. Slippery elm is considered inferior to American elm wood, but it's often sold as soft elm. It is relatively hard and with strong with reddish brown heartwood. The sapwood tends to be paler. It has interlocking grain, which makes it resistant to splitting, and it's rated as non-durable and susceptible to insect attack. Slippery elm seeds and buds are eaten by a variety of birds and small mammals, including American goldfinch, Baltimore oriole, and chickadees, as well as rabbits, possums, and squirrels. The slippery elm is also one of the hosts for the morning cloak butterfly larva. The twigs are browsed by rabbits and deer, and the tree provides thermal cover and nesting sites for several primary and secondary cavity nesters. Slippery elm wood is used for boxes, furniture, and wood pulp. The inner bark is edible and has long been used to soothe irritated mucous membranes and is still produced commercially for over-the-counter sales. As of 2021, the National Champion Slippery Elm is located in Jefferson County, Kentucky, so it's also our state champion. This tree can be found at the Masonic Home of Kentucky. It is 282 inches in circumference, 90 feet tall, with an 82 and a half foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry National Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about slippery elm. The common name is from the gelatinous or slippery inner bark, and its other common name of red elm is from the reddish heartwood. Reportedly, the yoke of the Liberty Bell was made from slippery elm wood. The wood has sometimes been used to make bows for archery. The scientific genus name Ulmus is the ancient Latin name for the elm, and the species name Rubra is from Latin and means red, which refers to the color of the heartwood. Thank you for joining me today to learn about this native elm, and I hope you get the opportunity to get out into a woodland, a local park, or neighborhood, and enjoy the slippery elm. Well, thank you, Lori, for that presentation. We greatly appreciate that. And, um, you know, I, one thing I was wondering is, how can you tell a slippery elm from an American elm? Um, there's a couple ways. It can be a little tricky, but um, one, the buds on um, slippery elm will be furry, or, or we call it like like sandpaper, um, much more so than American elm, but so you've got to have them side by side to kind of tell the difference. The flowers on slippery elm are, don't have, um, they don't hang on pendicels. They'll be much tighter around the twig than American elm. The leaves are also on slippery elm will be, I mean, it's like sandpaper on the top and on American elm, it's not nearly that rough. And then the bark, like I mentioned, the bark is um, a different, and that's one you could do without having them be side by side to compare them. We always call the ice cream sandwich bark, 
on American Elm, if you kind of flake off a little bit and you look on like the profile of where you flaked it off, you can see mm -hmm. brown and then the white buff colored layer and then brown again. And you oh. don't see that in Slippery Elm. So so that's a that's a good one, especially if it's this time of year, you know, and you can't really get a good look at maybe the buds or something like that. So, yeah. So, Billy, you were mentioning the medicine aspect of it. Yeah. Um, do they still use it? Well, it becomes a problem. And Laura, you may have uncovered some more information in your research, but um, yeah, we've had some reports and it happens a lot of um, landowners having their trees being stripped of Slippery Elm Park. Mm -hmm. um, and there is kind of a market for that Slippery Elm Park. You know, I would encourage everyone to don't do that to your neighbor's trees, right? <laughs> you know, if, if it's your tree, that's one thing, but don't do it to somebody else's tree for sure, because it can um, hurt the tree, obviously, and shorten its life. But there are some medicinal properties um, associated with that that inner park. Laura, you want to add a little to that? Well, and as I said in there, I mean, it's still sell, sold as an over-counter, and it helps soothe mucous membrane, sore throats. It even helps in the digestional track so it's it's sold as they make it in capsules but um it's still sold today yeah. but yes yeah, someone said um eric said it happened all the time at kentucky ridge state forest it and we, we get calls in here occasionally like is did someone strip is, is this is this an elm did because there's a big chunk of bark taken out of it so yeah, yeah. So don't do it to your neighbor's tree. No. <laughs> <laughs> or, or on a or, or or on, on a public land, yes. Right, yes. Yeah. If don't. it's your land, that's one thing for sure. Right. But, um, you know, it's also a good reminder that so many of our medicines have come and derived from, you know, native plants and natural plants that are out there. So, um, you yeah, know, take care of the stuff. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you, Lori, for joining us yet again. We great Love it. Always great. Yeah. Good job. Oh. It's a special <laughs> month too, right? You know, it is a special month, <laughs> and we have Dr. Ellen Crocker here to talk all about that special month. Hey, Hello, Dr. everyone! Hi. Nice to see you again. <laughs> you I don't know really if we want, want to celebrate this. But <laughs> I know that's what I was like. It is special, but uh, you know. So this month, you know, April is, a, is special for a lot of things. We celebrate a lot of tree related holidays in April. April is also invasive plant pest and disease awareness month. So all of those insects and uh, pathogens that are causing problems in our woods. Um, so something to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, every month I bring you a new pesky plant to be on the lookout for, a new invasive plant to look for in your woods, in your landscape setting, and, you know, try to stop it before it establishes. Um, and this month is no different. And we've got one that might be popping up and hopefully not, but you might see it in your woods, maybe even in your neighborhood to look for. So today we have lesser celandine or also known as fig buttercup. And, um, you know, it looks beautiful. And so I, I get why people plant this and why they pick uh, lesser celandine or fig buttercup. Um, you know, it's got these bright yellow flowers that are really pretty. And it's kind of one of the first things to come up in the spring. Uh, you've got these beautiful yellow flowers and this dark, green, glossy uh, leaves, um, but it's really been a, a problem and it's increasing rapidly in our area. Um, so not only is this toxic to humans and wildlife, it's in that buttercup family, but it can cause big problems in natural areas because it forms this really dense mat. And I'll show you some other photos of that. So here's kind of a, an example of what it can do. And so the reason why it's a problem is that it'll rapidly take over and crowd out other things. Um, it's a spring ephemeral. So it kind of, the leaves emerge really early in the season. You'll see them in February even. And then it flowers right now is when it's flowering. And then everything dies back. So that means that it's competing with your other spring ephemerals that are around, which is a problem because you want to be seeing your beautiful trilliums and other species in your woods. You don't want to be seeing this big mat of lesser celandine, no matter how pretty it is. It doesn't really play well with others, um, but also because uh, as it dies back, it's going to leave that soil exposed, so more likely to erode in the future. Um, because, you know, nothing's growing there. So it's originally from Europe, uh, parts of Northern Africa and Western Asia, and it was introduced to North America as an ornamental plant. 
And, um, you know, you can see why. And I've seen people plant their entire gardens with it. Um, unfortunately, it does not stay put and it will move rapidly. And I read one report uh, in researching this plant uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, that there were two yards that had planted it in there, just two and just a little bit. Um, but within 30 years, it had already expanded to over 300 acres of it. And much of that was really solidly uh, this plant, this lesser celandine. Um, so it can rapidly take over. And uh, kind of the first place you'll probably see it taking over are these riparian areas, those creek sides and streams. And I think part of that is because of the way it spreads. It has these little bulbs under the ground um, that if the soil erodes, it could easily move downstream that way. And it likes those wet areas, but unfortunately it doesn't stay put there and it can you know, live in a wide range of different habitats. So it can also move into kind of more upland settings. So here you see it um, somewhere, you know, in the woods in a more upland setting, just up from one of those rivers. Um, it can also kind of take over in yard settings. So this is uh, some little spot here in Lexington. You can see it's in the grass and it's growing and someone might think it's pretty, um, but it will take over and spread out from there. So um, unfortunately it's pretty, and it pops up early in the year and you might see it and think, I want that, but you don't, you don't want this. <laughs> uh, so it can completely take over. So how does it spread? Well, in addition to moving around on its own and spreading in the soil, uh, it's got those tiny little bulbs and some of those are actually above ground, some are below ground, these tiny, tiny bulbs that make it really hard to pull up, but it means that it can be spread around um, by us unintentionally. And here's a picture of some of those. You can see these tiny tiny little bolts. Um, so you can imagine it'd be hard to pull it up and get all of those. Um, it'd be easy to accidentally move that in soil. And even deer, as they're walking around, um, if soil gets stuck on their hooves, can move those little bulbs around. So it can spread really easily and then these little bulbs can sprout and cause new plants. So what does it look like and how would you identify it? Um, it's got these shiny dark green leaves that are kind of heart shaped and um, you can see they're glossy and this dark green pretty color um, and that's going to be very early in the year. Um, there, right now, you're also going to start to see some of this flowering, and they have this dappled, water-spotted appearance, the leaves, in my opinion, um, that would distinguish them from some other kind of heart-shaped, glossy green leaves this time of year. Uh, so instead, when we're thinking about managing lesser celadine, I really encourage you, no matter how pretty it is, don't plant it, don't see it in a park and dig it up and put it in your neighborhood, you'll regret it. Um, and also encourage you, you know, we've got some native species that look kind of similar. So first, you know, to recognize those and to not mistake them for lesser celandine, but also if you're looking for some good native alternatives, um, look, look to them. So things like green and gold, um, you can see how that might be confused with it, those pretty yellow flowers, or even the celandine poppy, which is coming up right now. I have got some in my garden and it does that same, you know, beautiful pop of yellow, um, a common forest understory species here. So don't plant lesser celandine. Pick one of these other natives instead. Um, if you do see it, uh, catch it before it spreads. It's much easier to manage when it's just a couple plants here and there versus an entire sea of it. So if you just catch a couple plants, you can um, dig it up. You can't really pull it up, but you could dig that entire kind of plant up and get rid of the whole root system. So unfortunately, this is not something you're gonna to wanna to compost. Uh, you wanna throw that away, <laughs> bag it up and throw it away um, and be aware of those little sprouts that might come from bulbs that have been left. Um, make sure you check it next year and the year after that to see if anything was left. Um, you could also try covering it with a plastic tarp for several seasons. Um, or you can use herbicide to control it, but make sure you do this before flowering. It's a lot less effective after the plant starts to flower. And with herbicide or any of these methods, you really wanna follow up for several years um, to make sure that you didn't miss anything or that it wasn't completely effective. Um, so, you know, you always wanna be monitoring for new arrivals 
and respout. So here you can see a video of uh, myself and some students out in a woodland nearby searching for lesser celandine. This is before it was flowering. So you might not be able to see the tiny little, little rosettes of leaves that we were finding, um, but uh, applying some herbicide directly onto those leaves um, before that flowering time and doing that year after year. So um, I think it's easy with any invasive plant to feel like you can't possibly have an impact. But I'm just going to show you this one example of um, the Arboretum woods, and they've been doing a great job with it. So I first found a patch of it in the woods. This is the University of Kentucky Arboretum in 2019. And that was the first time that we'd noticed it. And you can see it had already kind of taken over a lot of places. And it's pretty and it looks really nice, but that's not what we want there, right? Um, so. Uh, in the past couple years, they've been able to manage it some using a variety of different techniques. And you can see that this year, you know, there's a flower or two, but really not that much. They've been able to keep it at bay and try to prevent it from establishing. So you can see some of those different techniques in, in action, those black plastic tarps um, that have been kind of covering some of those plants to kill them over time. Uh, so just kind of some encouragement to any of you that are dealing with lesser celandine, uh, you know, you can, you can have a big impact. So here are some useful resources that you can visit to learn more. Um, there's great books available from the US Forest Service on management of invasive plants, uh, different non-native species and how to identify them and distinguish them from native lookalikes. And if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me. You know, there are a lot of invasives in your woods, but there's also a lot you can be doing about that. Um, so with that, I just want to turn it over. So does it have a, uh, I see we have a question from Kathy. Does it have seeds to create the bulblet before it can flower? So um, it does produce seeds, but they're pretty rare, all things considered. You don't see them that often. Um, what you're really looking for when it comes to moving it around are those tiny little bulbs. Well, it, it gets us every time. A beautiful plant, but causes us a lot of grief. Um, so. Ellen, thanks for bringing our attention to this for sure. Wonderful. And I know it's kind of like calorie repair and that's one of those beautiful ones that's flowering right now. And yeah. there's this temptation that it looks so pretty right now. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, there's lots of other native plants that are much better alternatives. Yeah, yeah. I so love thanks. these segments. They're really good. So please share these segments with people you know so they don't have this problem down the road for sure. Maybe we need to get you to do a segment on if you like this invasive, <laughs> what you can plant instead. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Try this, not that. Yes. Yeah, right. no, no. uh, exactly. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Crocker, you did a great job with this forest health stuff, and we really appreciate all your efforts. So. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, we've wow. done it again. Wow, Renee, a year in the books, and we're already starting on our second year. And again, a big thanks to all of our viewers out there, all of the guests that we've had on the show. Um, yeah. Thank you. Very we much. couldn't do this show without them and without you. So we greatly appreciate you watching every week. Um, and uh, we always uh, try to come up with new topics. And again, if you have any kind of uh, show idea, you can go on from the woods today.com and we have this little survey that you can click on and you can submit your show ideas. And we've ran several show topics that uh, people have asked for. Yeah. So please help us spread the word. Let others know about this. And again, you know, 50 episodes are in the books online. So check those out if you've missed any of them. And, uh, you know, we'll look forward to seeing you all every week at 11 o'clock. I'm from the woods today. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.